Hey everybody, um, this is just a ramble video, picking another subject from that list of videos I never quite made it to, um, and I've set up in the corner of the same room that you guys are normally used to seeing me in. Um, you might recognize like the corner of this bookcase, maybe. Uh, yeah, there's that poo right there. Um, so. What am I doing? I'm just whitewashing a uh, coat hanger uh, because Misty wants it for the hallway, but it's not the right color. So I'm just whitewashing it so that we can mount it. And this is actually the corner that I actually normally paint in. I've rigged this whole setup with... Uh, I made a video about this before. There's a camera uh, connection up there so I can just point down at what I'm working on. Um, it's like a whole art corner in my studio here. And uh, I opened the window because it's getting kind of hot in this uh, second story room. Um, so if, there, if there's neighbors that are yelling at each other, which happened about five minutes ago, you guys will overhear it. Um, I don't know what they're fighting about. But they're always fighting about something. Anyways, today's topic for my ramble was supposed to be the obsolescence of my old job in the Army. And uh, when I was in the Army, I had an MOS. And for those of you who were never in the Army, that means Military Occupation Specialty. Mine was 35 Hotel, and that was a test, measurement, and diagnostic equipment, maintenance, support specialist. And basically, I tested everything and put little white stickers on them. Uh, this was multimeters, uh, torque wrenches, scales, spectrum analyzers, oscilloscopes, lots of oscilloscopes. That was where I got stuck a lot of the time. Because I was really good at it. But, uh, yeah, I did a lot of production control work where I was basically managing labs and picking who was going to be uh, working on what piece of equipment. And we had this uh, term jumping on the grenade while I was in the Army. Uh, it wasn't literal, okay? What it meant was something uh, horrible just came into the lab, it was very hard to do. And I would pick who would jump on the grenade. And most often, I would be the one jumping on the grenade. Um, it would be a, a piece of equipment that hardly every, anyone ever saw. Um, so, yeah. <sighs> what I wanted to talk about was the obsolescence of that job. Um, many times uh, in my career, I had to replace things inside of these uh, test equipments uh, at a component level. This means soldering resistors, capacitors, uh, transistors, just about everything in and out of these things. Uh, whatever's broken, you fix, right? Well, there was this other uh, MOS for computer repair that we would make fun of, right? Because they didn't repair things at a component level, they did what we called pluck and chuck. Pluck and chuck was basically pull a card out of a desktop computer and throw it away and order a new one. Pluck and chuck, right? Well, the whole fucking world is now pluck and chuck as far as electronics are concerned. There is, like, I could have repaired a, a rotary telephone you know, or a push-button telephone. Nowadays, a cell phone, if there's anything broken on it, you throw it away and you buy a new one, right? Same thing with computers, same thing with desktops, laptops. If there's something broken on it, you're throwing away the whole thing. If it's a tablet, you know, you throw away the whole fucking thing. There is no uh, consumer end repair uh, needed. And after a while, the job that I had in the army went away. It wasn't uh, while I was in the service. 
Uh, but a couple years after I left, they basically uh, contracted out all of their repair work so that uh, they just basically bought extras of everything. And if it broke, they would send it back to the manufacturer rather than having their own repairman try to repair it. This costs a lot of money, but it's a lot more practical in terms of being able to uh, fulfill a mission because the, the needs of the mission, you know, those come first. And if you've got people and you need people, say, shooting guns rather than calibrating electronics, well, you pull your electronics calibrators and you put them on the front lines. And that happened to a lot of my coworkers who were in the army during the Iraq War. They were repurposed from their jobs in the calibration labs. Oh, well, that's a little splatter there. You see that right there? That's a little splatter that'll give my room some flavor. Anyways, um, let me know if I'm painting this wrong. Go ahead. I'm not going with the grain or something. That's awesome. All of my friends eventually got the pink slip. It was in order to reclass or uh, re-enlist under some other uh, MOS or get out of the army. And towards the end of my tour of duty, my six years in the army, I got it too. But I was getting out anyway as a uh, disabled vet, so I didn't care. I was like, fine, put me down for getting out of the army. That's one less person you have to take out with this program. I'm game, just uh, count me as one of your quota. But after I got out, the world kept changing, you know, and I got a job uh, with a couple of different companies, most notable of which was General Electric. And I was doing almost exactly the same thing that I was doing in the Army for General Electric. But as time went on, the need to know legacy systems and antiquated pieces of equipment kept uh, passing us by. Uh, factories kept upgrading and uh, the need to know old systems, like even the need to know DOS was just leaving, you know. I was lucky, because it had nothing to do with my job in the Army, but I was a gamer back in the days of the uh, Tandy 1000 and the 8088, those, those kind of desktop computers, and uh, yeah. Um, you learn DOS and DOS shell pretty quick, and there were a lot of legacy systems at GE where the actual technicians that they hired to use them had no idea about DOS commands, you know. And so for a while, that tacit information was uh, very useful to me, but more and more it w became obsolete as they bought new systems and they invented new ways of doing things that made the old ways antiquated. For example, they had for MR, uh, sorry, for x-ray machines, they had uh, glass tubes that were vacuum tubes, that were giant glass tubes that they would bake, they called it baking for a while, in order to test them, and they would sell these tubes and they would also sell contracts to hospitals. While I was working for GE, they had these contracts where it was like $100,000 a year and we will replace as, as many tubes as you need. And these are as fragile as light bulbs in, in a room, in a bathroom, right? They could go out at any minute, right? So rather than having to spend $75,000 a piece, you could spend $100,000 and buy this insurance contract, right? Well, then they came out with this tube called the Ulysses, and it made glass tubes for x-ray equipment obsolete. And all of the different systems 
that use these Ulysses um, tubes, for a better, for lack of a better word, they uh, they were a lot more sturdy. They didn't break down as much. They didn't need replacement as much. And the only reason for the legacy tubes really was hospitals donating their old X-ray gear to third world countries. So basically, these these X-ray tubes were now a big export, but even third world countries would be like, eh, no, we don't really want your old x-ray stuff because it just costs too much for that uh, bulb replacement plan when we could just, you know, start a, a Indiegogo fundraiser and get a new system ourselves that doesn't have these glass tubes. The world kept on reinventing itself, and I realized this, and so when I went to the University of Wisconsin at night while I was working at GE, I didn't take anything related to my career. I often told people, uh, you should go to school to learn what you want to learn, not what your employer wants you to know, you know? And so I went to school for English and psychology, which I thought were pretty basic subjects that, uh, wouldn't really have a chance of going the way of the dodo, you know? Everything that that uh, comes out as far as new technology and new ways to do things will require that you have, have a manual and you will have to be able to read it. So I figured English will serve me well. Uh, psychology, well, that's my new profession. You know, that's I do psychotherapy. I slap crack pipes out of people's mouths, I kick the bong to the curb, and I help people work on addiction, and I don't see robots being able to do my job anytime soon. But the reason why I chose this profession originally was a real look at um, how I felt technology was moving so quickly that you could go to college with a career in mind and then by the time you're through with your degree, that career could no longer exist, you know? If you were hiring someone at your company for a computer engineering job and their degree was bestowed upon them in computer sciences in 1980, you're not hiring that person. You're going to hire the kid who got his degree two years ago who's passed the MCSE for Microsoft, like, last month. You know, and he can prove that his skills are up to date. Whereas, I, I feel like in my new profession, age only really helps me. You know, my experience with older people, with certain cultures, uh, all of that, in that information that I've gathered and put into this skull, it only helps me, you know. It doesn't make me look like I'll be worse at my job. And it's, it's pretty hard for me to see a lot of people going into careers that I feel like are going to be antiquated. Like, per se, YouTuber. You know, YouTuber is something that a lot of people have tried to cultivate their... Uh, job to be, and I would say about, uh, at one time, 10% of my income, this was a couple years ago, 10% of my income used to come from YouTube. Um, I was I always found it easier to make money in the real world outside of YouTube, but, yeah, I've, I've seen people quit their, their careers and put everything else on hold in order to become YouTubers, whereas I feel like they should be diversifying. Even if the new platforms that they would go to aren't immediately monetizable, like uh, how do you earn money for posting your videos to Facebook? Um, and, and the reason why is at any moment something could shift. You know, something could change about the technology. Um, I feel like with the the increase of, in population on, in the world in general, 
more and more people will create more and more videos and after a while it's going to be hard for people to amass that sort of uh, following that others have, have built a career on and those careers will be fighting for basically attention span there's going to be thousands upon thousands of youtubers that are just as good as anyone else and everyone is going to be fighting for attention span then came the move from many uh, network TV studios where they started moving their products onto YouTube you know it is fucking odd for me to see Trevor Noah in this little vignette at the end of a a segment of the Daily Show and he's like you know you want to subscribe you know I, I, I won't look you know because I know that's that's probably that's probably uh, not something you want me to do so I look away and you could just subscribe you know something like that so he makes that pitch to subscribe just like youtubers normal youtubers that that don't have TV shows right that don't have the budgets that these television shows have that don't have the equipment and so when these shows start moving into the same space we're all fighting for uh, a slice of the attention span right who's gonna lose you think they're gonna lose they have the money you know I would like to think that raw talent could win out but I don't even want to insult some of uh, the other YouTubers on this platform, but there are names I could name that I'm like, no, talent did not win out. Talent uh, took a back seat to the popularity game. But anyway, I would hope that anyone who was thinking about making YouTube their career would have the presence of mind to diversify into something that is a little bit more uh, a little bit more change resistant a little bit uh, more of a parachute style of business plan like dominating all of the different types of social media at the same time not just YouTube right? Um, I would hope that you would expand into being a Facebook personality. Somebody who posts their content onto Facebook even though you know, you're not immediately getting the, uh, the AdSense rewards that you would on YouTube. You have to realize any good video on YouTube that's going to make a million video, a million video views it's being reposted to Facebook and it's getting 50 million views and you're not cashing in on that you know if you're not moving your content over um, I would hope that people would post on Dailymotion on Vimeo on any upstart you know if they were going to make this uh, a career myself I've actually decided that uh, my career is not on YouTube you know my career uh, has to do with helping people in the real world and I just do this YouTube thing just to do it and if I happen into some, some success at this so be it you know everybody wants their videos to be seen but for me it's more of a uh, a voice thing than a career thing um, I've seen too many starving artists in my life to pin my hopes and dreams on my art you know so today I'm not even painting something that's uh, going to be recognizable to people so that I can sell it you know um, today I'm painting something that's just going to hang in my house and and I'll be able to hang my coats on it on these little pegs you know something that is practical and I would hope everyone hears me when I say this you need to be more practical than just put putting all your hopes and dreams and being famous on YouTube one day because it's a, a pipe dream just like being a rock star 
That's about your chances right there. Anyways, I'm gonna let this coat dry and go at it again later. Laters.